Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX is brought to you by IG, the world leading online trading and investments provider. Welcome. You're listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded podcast with Daily FX. I'm your host, Senior Analyst at Daily FX, Tyler Yell. Daily, we bring you trading insights on the world's biggest market, the $5 trillion a day FX market as well as commodities and other key assets while describing the opportunities that may be emerging around the world. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Trading Global Markets Decoded. Today, we have Tracy Shukart, known on Twitter as Shy Girl. She is an oil trader without equal. She, of course, knows a ton about energies, indices, metals, and FX, but crude seems to be her heart and her home in the markets. Tracy's practically the queen of a group online called the OOTT. It's the Organization of Oil Traders on Twitter. For traders keen on oil price moves or developments affecting the outlook of oil, most recently Venezuela, Nigeria, and other OPEC plus compliance issues, she's a must follow. Tracy has an incredible grasp for price action as a crude trader as well, and she uses some unique tools like footprint charts to track big orders. In addition to the interplay of fundamental analysis and price action, Tracy tends to have multiple paths that she uses to plan a trade, which just gives you some insight into her mind as she approaches markets. Tracy, welcome and thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you. That was a big introduction. Thanks. Worthy. Um, glad to be on. <laughs> Worthy introduction. So let's just start with how you came into the markets before we get into some of the aspects that are currently going on. So I came to you, like I'm sure some other people did, when Raul Paul said that you were recommended to him, but you were a, a must-go-to source in terms of what's going on in the markets in, in mid-2017. And, you know, of course, I heard that, and, and I took note, and I started following you, as I'm sure many other people did, I had before then and, and since then. But would you mind sharing a bit about your background and what led to you becoming an authority on commodities and specifically oil as you are now? Well, I mean, it's kind of, I, this is sort of my second career, believe it or not. Um, I actually, I was uh, living in California and I was in the sales industry in medical device sales. Mm -hmm. And I just decided one day I didn't really like what I was doing and I wasn't happy. I was traveling all the time. I was never home. And, you know, I had always been really interested in the commodity markets. My background is in political science and international relations with an emphasis on Middle East studies. So kind of background within Middle East politics, which, you know, a, a larger portion of that obviously has to do with the oil industry. So right. my background kind of it, it was more in that and not really in the sales realm. <laughs> so really, one day I decided that I didn't like my job anymore and I literally quit my job. I packed my things and I moved to Chicago. I had never been there before in my life. Didn't know anybody, didn't have a job. Moved there and literally just knocked on doors in the industry. And at the time, you know, it wasn't really a big industry for women. There weren't a lot of women in the industry. So, you know, it was kind of difficult to even get a job. So I didn't care what I did. So my first job that I landed was actually as a broker mm -hmm. in basically a boiler room selling options and futures. And so and then from there, I just kind of worked my way up. So that's kind of really how I got involved in the industry. Perfect. And in terms of actually starting to trade, were you trading before you moved from California to Chicago or were you trading as a broker? When did you start really breathing markets, not from a, you know, I guess a sales side, but from uh, actually putting the trade on and, and managing that side? Well, actually, it started as a broker because you're trained, right? Right. In the markets and things like that. And so really initially when you're coming to people with ideas, they're your ideas, right? So you have to kind yeah. of, so really initially from the beginning, you know, even though it's a sales call, you know, you're still, still have to come up with, gain some background. And so they do provide you with a lot of training and, and things like that. So it was a really good way, I guess, to break into the industry, even though it's not, wasn't the funnest job in the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it did, you know, it did provide me a lot of training, a lot of exposure to markets, a lot of, you know, things like that. And especially because, you know, it was right jumping in the commodities markets. And since it was not focused on any one industry, it really gave me an introduction to sort of to everything from, you know, grains to livestock to 
energies, currencies, and things like that. So, you know, at one point or another, literally, I probably traded everything. <laughs> like, even. Well, and it does seem to support you nowadays because you have a really strong macro view and that I've seen you write on currency correlations, the commodity market, and I, I guess now knowing a bit more about your background covering international relationships as well. Is there a component of global markets that you feel kind of um, best describes currently, I guess, the risk sentiment or what, what seems to be driving markets currently or as, as you trade markets, something that you see having a, a stronger uh, factor impact than something else? Well, I think I'm watching what everybody else is watching. And that's basically, you know, I'm watching global growth. You know, we had this whole period where it's global growth, global growth, global right. growth, and all these things coming in, you know, it's really a slowdown. So really, I kind of focus on, you know, exactly in a macro sense, you know, I want to know what's going on with currencies. I also want to know what's going on, especially uh, with China. China's pretty much related to the, the energy industry. You know, China's sort of the buyer of last resort. Now, you know, I want to be watching their, say, their manufacturing numbers, things like that, that I factor into how is that going to affect their import numbers? How is that going to, you know, of crude oil and mm -hmm. things like that? So, you know, I'm really watching that and those kind of things across, you know, you want to be watching manufacturing across Europe right now, you know, with Germany going down and things like that. So in a macro sense, you can take all this macro data and you want to kind of fine tune it into whatever commodity industry that you're currently trading or currently look at and not necessarily, you know, energies, the grains, things like that. Perfect. And, you know, it seems like I think one of the tweets that you had shared recently was about Japan noting that, you know, they were having some problems with growth because shipments to China were down. And then at the same time, like, you know, recently I was looking at the economic surprise index uh, from City on emerging markets. It's at like a three year low. So it's crazy. And some of it might be counter trend rally. And I'd like to get your view on this. But it's crazy because it doesn't seem like growth is obviously nowhere near where it could be, but also kind of trailing the recent mean. There's some good things out there, but it's, it's amazing to see crude up, you know, 25% on WTI year to date and 24%. Right. Obviously, it was a horrible drop at Q4 last year, but where do you think the disconnect is in terms of you're seeing this aggressive rally to start the year, but the growth picture, that macro picture, it doesn't smell right. Exactly. I think that this is what, I mean, how you have to break this down. And this is what makes it kind of sometimes difficult to, when you're just tweeting things, to how it comes across, right? right. Because everybody's timeline is kind of different. So what I'm looking at, a macro view, you know, what I'm looking at is what does this picture look like a year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road? When you're looking at macro, you know, it depends on what your timeline is. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm looking at the macro sense, I'm looking at the bigger picture, a year out, two years out, three years out, what have you. But right now, we're currently seeing is this, you know, this rally, and we're also seeing it in equities too. Is you know, and I mentioned this, you know, last year in December, it was that you know a lot of these commodities were so beat up last year, mm -hmm. and there were you know it wouldn't surprise me to see some fun flows into these commodities because just because they were so beat up, and you know, you know, it was a good where are you going to put your money? So I think we're seeing some of that right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think so in the immediate term, when we're looking, you know, over the past month, which I consider kind of short term. And this is where COT, I think, plays a huge role, even though we haven't had that report because the government right. shut down. <laughs> but, Shame, isn't it? <laughs> which is kind of really annoying. Yeah. Uh, but but ICE does have ICE is out. So you can look at Brent it is correlated to some sense. But, you know, I mean, that's all we have right now. Right. I mean, even the data coming out now is, you know six like, weeks old yeah it doesn't really help but i mean if you notice if you still notice and you started to notice like the end of last year in december where i mean oi in general was just mm -hmm. this massive number earlier in the year and like oi shrank to you know half the size mm -hmm. i mean you know it just got to the point where it was an attractive buy right because right. you couldn't get everybody's out of the market market's going down it's the first of the year. Where are you going to put your money? And then what we really saw at, you know, for the first four weeks, if looking at Brent, I'll say Brent because I don't have the data for WTI, but looking at Brent, we had a lot of short covering too in, in yeah. the beginning of the new year. And then 
we were kind of range bound in the area where OPEC came in and said, we want to stabilize this market. If you remember when they came in and said, we want to stabilize this market mm -hmm. after the OPEC meeting, we kind of stabilized in like 50 to 55 range. And then all of a sudden we had that last, uh, along with equities, we had that last minute, like 10 buck dive, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the market, market came back, right back up really quickly. And then we're now sort of breaking out of that range. But, mm -hmm. you know, the last few weeks we've been staying in that range where OPEC said they wanted to stabilize the market. So I kind of feel like that last, you know, that last $10, even though it's a lot, $10 <laughs> was kind of like a capitulation move, right? And so then we come back up, people are starting to get a little bit more interested. I'm not sure if this, if the fundamentals and the long-term macro view supports much higher than this maybe 60, right. but that's how I would take immediate term data and kind of meld it into macro term data. That Excellent. kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and it does seem like that strong bounce the last week of December and then so forth was uh, the opposite reaction, if you will, to the capitulation in the sense of I was looking at a, a 12 month, basically 12 month average and then standard deviations on that. And we were close to a three standard deviation move on the downside with that December 24th drop. So it does seem like we've moved there. And it, and it is, you know, looking across and this is, I guess, an, another question I'd have for you is crude has so many cross currents, <laughs> obviously with, the, you know, all the relationships with where OPEC is on compliance, Venezuelan mess, there's so many things going on. How do you track of those things and, and how do you decide what deserves your attention or not on given any given day, week or month? So, you know, if I'm looking at sort of macro data, I mean, Venezuela is a disaster, but, you know, we've kind of known Venezuela has been a disaster for a few years. Now, right? <laughs> Fair, so, yeah. I, I mean, it's pretty much, this is not Venezuela action. If you notice, you know, when everything just happens with Venezuela, with the new puppet government or whatever, right. two governments, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, you know, it really didn't affect oil price. I mean, we were still just bouncing in that kind mm -hmm. of consolidation zone. So this has, to me, you know, Venezuela is something that, you know, it's been a problem for a long time. It's factored in the market. Something like Nigeria and Libya, mm -hmm. always problems there, right? So but problems that you have that, you know, have been long-term problems, I think have already had already been factored in the market by traders. They already know that there's problems there. They already expect to, there to be problems there. So, you know, some of those things don't matter as much. Now, something, you know, like Iran sanctions come along, which came, you know, out of the blue. And then the waivers, that's when you really saw things really affect the market. So it's kind of just, I guess, knowing kind of the history and knowing, you know, which countries have ongoing problems, which countries don't, but, you know. Right. And, and that really just has to do with, honestly, either, you know, knowing history or, yeah. you know, keeping up with the market and things like that. So given your background, it, it, it's probably hard to distill some key things that you learn from the market. I know for me, like the prize from Daniel Jurgen was, was super helpful. Were there things that yeah. you found super helpful in terms, I mean, you had the international relationship background from school, but was there, was there things that you found super helpful in terms of seeing just how important and how broad the energy markets are? I mean, I think, it, you know, the, the prize is an excellent book. Oil One is another really excellent book if you want to kind of, it can get kind of a technical, like as far as the chemistry of. Could you repeat you know, that name again? Like it's called Oil 101. Okay, great. And that's, it's a really good book if you are have never traded oil before, if you're a beginner and you're in the oil markets and you kind of want to know really what all, what the industry is about, who has what where it's from and it's mm -hmm. you know just a really nice broad basic background again it does get a little bit heavy on the like if you're a chemical engineer you mm -hmm. would really love it <laughs> so it does get kind of heavy sometimes in those areas you know which is definitely not my forte but all in all it's a really good broad general introduction to the oil markets and kind of you know the different grades and what you're looking for and who has what and some political background and things of that nature. So that's a highly recommended book. Um, also, Oil Volatility is another good book, like Step Up. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good book, gives a lot of uh, background 
you know, the prize, so you read the prize, I read the prize, it's huge. Yes, so if, it's a tome. <laughs> if you, you don't have that much time, you know, these two books are really great too. You know, even if you are an experienced trader, I mean, those books are still, I think, a good uh, refresher. I think, um, yeah, I think the one thing I got from the prize, in addition to the just historical ramifications of, of the world we have today, is just, it's, I mean, crude's more important than most bonds, you know, most stocks, like when the, the function that crude plays in the global economy is insane. equal to none. It's insane. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, basically everything that we do requires energy that is basically comes from uh, oil or a derivative of oil. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, it really literally does make the world go around. I mean, <laughs> we do have renewable energy and things like that, but those are sort of, you know, rather new technologies and, you know, really only like 20% of the market. So literally everything we do requires some sort of energy right. source and fossil fuel. <laughs> So in 2018, one of the things that stood out to me, and I'm sure this has happened in years past, but to me it really stood out in 2018, was that different benchmarks had completely different stories going on. So you know, Canadian crude became an important story as it diverged so aggressively, and then you know, WTI and Brent seem to be playing off different fundamentals due to the the shell, and and then of course the OPEC plus compliances. Are there any specific oil benchmarks in 2019 that you think could have almost a unique volatility event or or something that has your specific attention? Well, I mean, I think in 2019, I would really be, uh, you know, what is available now, you know, I'd really be watching that uh, WTI Brent spread mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's uh, likely to go wider because right now we have a shortage of sort of this sour crude and we have too much light crude, not just WTI, we have too much light crude in general. I mean, Nigeria produces light crude. We've got Arab, like there's a lot of light crude in this world right now, which is really great. Right. But what's happening is that we have all this light crude and basically what you can make from it is gasoline. So what we're seeing now is everybody's refining this and now we're sort of seeing a gasoline glut. Um, whereas demand, because of uh, car efficiencies and a, a lot of other things, we're kind of seeing like this big gasoline glut right now. Mm -hmm. Now, what we really need is this heavier, gunkier crude because right. it makes diesel. Um, and what's happening is, and everybody's watching about initiative in 2020 to make all of the shipping industry adhere to new standards. And that means they have to change all of their fuel and right now they need you know um light sulfur diesel which we don't have and light mm. crew can't make that so and with a saudi cut and things like that right now we're kind of seeing a deficit we're already starting to see a deficit in the sour crude industry so that's something that you know i would be watching and the only really way to play that because you know there aren't a lot of benchmarks that have paper traders can trade. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're a physical trader, you can trade, you know, whatever grade is out there. But us being traders, paper traders, right? Uh, you know, we're just trading paper barrels. That's the best way, I think, you know, to play that sort of situation in 2019 that is just starting to happen. And you'll see that spread actually since the beginning of the year is widened to about $3. And I think that possibly could Further, depending on, I mean, obviously watch OPEC, but, you know, Saudi's already cutting back even more next month and things like that. So, right. you know, that's, some, that's an item that I'm really keeping my eye on for 2019. Can I ask, as an oil trader, in terms of the volatility that we've seen, which seemed to, for majority, uh, you know, let's say the, our first three quarters of 2018 seemed to be pretty subdued and then got really aggressively in Q4 and it's been pretty aggressive in Q1, though, because we're moving higher, it's, it's kind of suppressed. But does that just to you mean that there's more uncertainty going on now? Or what kind of message do you think the recent volatility has for the outlook for crude? I mean, um, crude traders love the volatility. Right. And with that, do you think that uh, volatility is going to continue up? I mean, some people look at this as a counter trend rally. I mean, basically, there was no volatility for years. So, I mean, oil was trading at $10, $20, $30 for years and years and years. Obviously, uh, crude traders love volatility. Oil producing nations do not. However, you know, if you go back um, in time and you look at longer term charts, mm -hmm. um, you will see that, you know, if you start from, 
20, 30 years ago, I mean, crude was trading like at $30 forever, right? And then suddenly we started having, you know, if you look now and if, you know, if you put on, say, a monthly chart, you notice crude's been very, very volatile within like the last 99, 2000, yeah. you know, we've had these ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. So, you know, I think that's likely to continue just because I think that I think the world's changed, right? And we have a lot more volatility and a lot more factors going on within the markets. And, you know, a lot of things, a lot of these markets are more integrated, more more tied together now. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, you know, with the equity markets and with the currency markets and things like that, where, you know, that wasn't always the case. Absolutely. Yeah, that that answers it perfectly. And (laughs) one thing that I think people fail to grasp, and we've touched on this a bit, is that few markets have that cabal-like feel that crude has. And and it seems like people don't understand the the powers coming from Russia, you know, which part of this OPEC plus or different countries and their supply. Is there anything you feel that traders, at least that you come in contact with that are newer to the market, fail to grasp, if you will, about trading this market or to derivatives of this market that puts them at maybe a a disadvantaged spot because they don't understand some of those geopolitics or some of the driving supply factors around crude? I mean, I think that mostly people don't just don't realize the magnitude of the market and how Mm -hmm. much of the market that encompasses. And it's literally a worldwide market. You know, if you're trading U.S. oats, right? If you're trading WTI, you're not you're trading benchmark of a worldwide product, right? right? So in which every single country in the world basically relies on. So I just think that that in the the broader scope of the market, I think people just don't realize what a big market it is and what you know what goes on. As well as if you just look at the paper market, you know, just look at like say WTI. I mean, what's trading today is we've had times this year where as many contracts traded in a day as traded ES. That's mm. incredible amounts, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, granted, it was a small day for ES and a large day for crude, but still, you know, it's a very big market and it's grown even bigger because, you know, because of volatility and things like that. Funds love to, you know, jump on because, you know, one crude runs one way or the other, it runs, right? So right. you have a lot of these momentum funds that, you know, trend followers, funds that love to jump on that kind of trend. The market is, the trading market is very big as well. And to that, and I agree, yeah, I think that, you know, it seems like just given recent price action that you, we do seem to have, we've gone from that short recovery to potentially those funds, the CTAs and, and such, jumping on to this moving crude. If you had to kind of split out what are some of the top side or downside risk factors going into 2019, where do you think things stand in that instance as things that could potentially take us higher, whether it's supply disruption, demand, whatever, or things that could potentially put a cap and push lower? Well, I mean, I think that as far as, you know, what, what I, again, what I would be watching is these macro events, you know, watch macro, watch worldwide demand. Mm-hmm. You also want to be watch U.S. production and things like that. And who else is producing light crude? How much light crude is there? You know, in my opinion, and also look at the, the curve. I mean, the crude curve basically out till, you know, 2020, these 2020 is we're in deep contango, which is, right. you know, pretty bearish place to be. Whereas you look at Brent and it's in backwardation. Hmm. Um, so, you know, when a curve is in Contego, it, you know, it doesn't pay you to be a fund and be in this market, right? Because you get screwed on the roll. Yeah. yeah. You know, basically, if you're in backwardation, you're getting paid to roll, basically. So, you know, that's why, you know, when a market's in backwardation, it gets longer and longer and longer and longer. So, you know, for me, looking at sort of a that conglomerate of factors makes me think that this run recently in WTI is pretty much you know, capped to the upset. Like, I don't see anything above 60 right now unless, you know, things fundamentally change, which right now it doesn't look that way. Obviously, anything could change, which is why you have to keep up with the markets all the time. But, you know, those are just some of the things that I kind of look at when I'm deciding, does this have room to run? Does it, you know, 
along with technicals and things like that. Like I'm not just a fundamental trader. You know, I always also look at the technical side too if I'm intraday trading or semi swing trading. Obviously, if I'm position trading, then that's I'm you know I'm looking more at at a global macro picture and taking a position that way. So, so to that end, I've heard you talk about footprint charts and having kind of multiple paths into trade view. Would you mind elaborating a bit on what footprint charts are, how you use them? I, I kind of think of it as market profile, but I think there's some differences there and how you came to this approach of having multiple paths to express a view. Yeah, I mean, I use market profile versus volume profile, which is um, time price opportunity versus just um, regular volume profile okay. chart. Only because I think that, and this is for for um, any kind of trading, I think, you know, whether you're swing trading or you're day trading, it kind of gives you a, a better picture of the market structure other than just the volume structure. Like I want to know what where everything's traded. I want to know where weak spots are because you can have weak spots in the market when the market always likes to go back and fill in those weak spots and things of that nature. So I think that's a very invaluable tool. There are books on market profile. If you haven't studied that before, mm -hmm. James Stolton has a really good book on it. And I think Stedemeyer is the person that I remember. Stedemeyer, yeah, yeah. Stedemeyer. Steel, yeah. Stedemeyer, trading on market profile. So, you know, if you're new to that, those are two good books to pick up. I also use footprint charts, just basically, it's basically an order flow chart. Okay. Right? So you're just kind of watching order flow. If you are new to that, Market Delta has some uh, great uh, YouTube videos on it, and you don't necessarily need their software, mm -hmm. but they do have some really good uh, a whole series on on using footprint charts and watching order flow. You know, if that's an invaluable tool, especially if you're a scalper, which I am not, but you know, it, it helps you determine you know, direction of the market in a day-to-day -day basis. So for day trading, it's it's very helpful. Thank you. And so for those unfamiliar with the online organization, the Oil Oil Traders of Twitter, the OOTT, can you give a bit of a background as to how that came about and how you became a, a prominent voice of the group? Actually, we I was talking to um, Samir Madini, who owns Tanker Trackers, right? Okay. And so, you know, we were all talking one day and he, actually he came up with it <laughs> because we were trying to find a way where basically because there was, we're getting news from everywhere, right? right? There's, you know, I have a list of, you know, I have like a tweet deck full of, you know, every country, you know, <laughs> what, whatever country, something is going on in every journalist I know, why don't we just find like a hashtag and then everybody can put this hashtag and then you could just have like a tweet deck column on that. And everything could come in yeah, and kind of great. like pull all this information. So it was his idea and his initiative, and I jumped on the bandwagon. <laughs> and a lot of journalists did too. So it's a really good hashtag to look up. You know, obviously not everything's there, but you know, a lot of journalists are there, a lot of oil traders are there, a lot of you know analysts are there. Yeah. So there's a lot of information within that um, within that hashtag. Good on you guys for, <laughs> I guess, for him developing it and for you joining on so early. Because to me, that's the purest and best use of a hashtag I've seen on Twitter for the years <laughs> that I've been yeah, on. Yeah, like it like works. Because everybody was like, should we do hashtag oil, hashtag CL, hashtag this, hashtag... I mean, it was all over the place. So, so yeah, it was a great idea. And Remains a good idea. It worked. <laughs> well, as we wrap up, would you mind sharing with the audience how they can follow you, as many undoubtedly will if they aren't already, or anything that you're working on that you want to share with everybody? Um, well, I'm on Twitter, obviously, at ShyGirl, C-H-I-G-R-L. I have a website, ShyGirl.com, but I haven't updated it, <laughs> so don't get mad at me, but I plan <laughs> on this year, it's one of my plan on... Uh, updating it more often so right now that's where you can where you can find me basically perfect well tracy thank you so much for being on thank you so much for the conversation i truly enjoyed it and uh we'll put some show notes together of it and um you know definitely uh, thank you so much for being on the show absolutely thank you 
Thank you for listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoder with Daily FX podcast. This podcast is brought to you by IG. Check us out at dailyfx.com. If you love the Trading Global Markets Decoder with Daily FX podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.